without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Simon. Simon's the head of library liaison, medicine and NHS, NH, medicine, university and NHS. It's quite a thing to juggle, isn't it? So in terms of hybrid working, my goodness, that's, that's quite a mixture. A head of library liaison at Imperial College London, where he oversees not one, but five libraries which serve Imperial's Faculty of Medicine and the five partner NHS trusts. So as a person who's got a bit of experience with influencing, I'm going to say, Simon, tell us how to do it. All the hybrid working and the influencing, tell us all the stuff. I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Isla. Uh, let me just see if I can get share my screen and get that up. Here we go. So thank you for the introduction. I think that's probably done my first slide, but as you said, I'm Simon Hall, Head of Library Liaison for Medicine in the NHS at Imperial College London, and looking today at uh, what are called routes to a flexible future uh, Imperial College Library service services in COVID and beyond. Uh, so before I start, I just wanted to give a couple of quick acknowledgements. Um, so my thanks to Catherine Rose and uh, Chris Banks from Imperial College Library Service, uh, both of whom I've kind of cribbed elements of this presentation from. Uh, so thank you to them uh, for that. And then colleagues at the Relationship Management Group, um, now, I wish I could give an individual um, thanks for this, but uh, a colleague of mine attended the Relationship Management Conference, I think it was the end of last year or the beginning of this one, and there's an excellent working practices grid exercise, which I'm going to mention later, uh, that came from there. So I thought I should probably just acknowledge that first. So just a few quick facts about Imperial College. We're uh, situated in Albertopolis, which is the part of town between Hyde Park and South Kensington Station, uh, which was Prince Albert's vision for a centre for the arts and sciences. Um, so we're next to the Science Museum, the V&A, Natural History Museum, Royal Colleges of Art and Music and the Royal Albert Hall, which is, makes it a lovely part of town to be in. Uh, it's a highly ranked and STEM focused university. I think we've got quite a unique portfolio of subjects within the UK. And we've got about 18,000 students and roughly 8,000 staff. Uh, it's highly international. So there's uh, about 60% of our students are from outside the UK and very research focused. And that research uh, emphasis really permeates the whole organization. Um, during COVID, we've played, well, the college and people in it have played a very active role in the government and public health response. Lots of our staff have sat on government advisory panels and things like that. You may remember uh, Professor Ferguson and his dalliances, but um, less said about that best. Um, and obviously, as I said, we, we, uh, as Isla said, we've got the medical school, uh, which I liaise with, and then five partner NHS trusts. So Imperial's got eight main campuses geographically. We're based in West London largely. Uh, the main campus at South Kensington is where most of the library staff are situated. We've got our central library and that's where uh, the majority of our staff work. But then the five libraries that I serve are based at uh, on or nearby hospital campuses. So uh, Hammersmith, uh, St Mary's, Charing Cross, Chelsea and Westminster and Royal Brompton Hospitals. But we've also got a large and growing campus at White City and then out in Surrey, one at Silwood Park as well. So I just thought I'd give a very brief uh, overview of the last year or so. I'm sure many of this will be similar to other universities which have faced uh, the same challenges uh, that we have. But obviously, the 23rd of March, beginning of lockdown one, all of our libraries closed. Uh, and uh, that was apart from the study space at Chelsea and Westminster, which is actually in the hospital building. And, and we did keep that open for the, for the hospital staff there. But apart from that, all of our libraries were closed. Uh, from, well, fast forward a few months and late July, we started the reoccupation of our, our libraries uh, to kind of get them set up for students coming back on site. And we started with the medical libraries because the Faculty of Medicine uh, requested that we get them open again early for the uh, incoming placement students, those start, students starting their, their clinical placements. Uh, a week or so later, the Central Library was reoccupied. And then from mid-August, our medical libraries were open uh, with a study space open for students and they were able to browse and borrow from the shelves uh, with a staffed inquiry service there. Central Library took a little bit longer to get up and running so they started with a click and collect service and a scan and send service with no in-person inquiries initially but the frontline staffed by our library attendants who are kind of 
security service within the library. Uh, Mid-September, the main central library reopened for study space and access to the book collection. And at that point, we ceased our click and collect service. We did have limited in-person inquiries at that point. So both the medical and the central libraries were operating a 10 to 4 uh, inquiry service. Then fast forward a few more months, and I'm sure we all remember lockdown two. Um, we reduced the in-person inquiries at Central Library, uh, but then uh, we kept our medical libraries with an inquiry service because really to keep those open and to keep the buildings open, we needed to have staff there. So we felt that we'd, we'd have some inquiry service. Lockdown three, everyone came back from Christmas and New Year's, and you know, I bet we all had those meetings on the Monday morning where we were working out what on earth we do with, uh, with our libraries. But we moved to no inquiry service at the central library, but we did keep the space open. At, at the medical libraries, we had a real skeleton staffing, often just one person in a day, uh, but we did keep that inquiry service open as much as possible and keep the spaces open. But then since March, uh, with the vaccine program rolling out and cases dropping, uh, we have had a phased resumption of our services. And those of, yeah, in particular, the services like our evening and weekend staffed inquiry services have resumed now. And that, that took quite a while over the last year, but, but we're there now. So as, as we emerge from lockdown three, we've been thinking about you know, moving beyond restrictions. You know, how do we move from, you know, lockdowns in and out of you know, in and out of the library and everybody working from home wherever possible to a future where maybe there's more hybrid working uh, but also ensuring that our services you know continue and, and the way that we can you know, make those work effectively staff are very keen to know how their roles would be affected and whether they could continue to work from home and i think covid has really shown that home working was compatible with providing of you know, many high quality library services but that it also shown that some services work, couldn't operate remotely. Those frontline services need people to staff them. So this presented us with some challenges, but also some opportunities. In terms of the challenges, you know, and I think this is something that's been running throughout the last year or so, maintaining that sense of community and team and making sure that uh, you know, people feel part of the wider whole, you know, that they're part of the organization, part of the department and part of the team when they're not necessarily in the same office as people. There's the challenge of delivering those front facing services whilst also facilitating more flexible working. And the fact that many staff have different preferences. So whilst it was clear that there was an emerging uh, yeah, pattern of requests for people to want to work from home uh, and continue to work from home, uh, that's not the case for everybody. I'm one of those people who like working in the office. I find uh, the office environment far more conducive to my style of working. So I've been keen to get back in here as, as often as possible. And then there's the challenges of staff expectations not always aligning with uh, yeah, the, the service requirements, particularly for frontline members of staff. And then things like equipping our offices so that we've got that greater flexibility, making sure that we've got the technology uh, and the, you know, the, the, the systems in places to allow us to use the space more flexibly and to allow us to work effectively in a hybrid environment. Opportunities wise, there's, there's potential for great benefits for our users. I think the, the last year has really shown us the benefits of technology enhanced learning and we've had you know, really positive feedback from some of our teaching and things like that where we've used Teams or Zoom to deliver uh, a lot of our teaching. Uh, also thinking about repurposing our office space for teaching or study. Uh, the college is, as I said, in South Kensington. Uh, we're bounded on all sides by pretty by grade one listed buildings. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the, the real estate costs of, in South Kensington are prohibitive. So yeah, really there is zero growth for our footprint at the uh, college at South Kensington. So anything that we can do to free up space for the college to allow that to be repurposed for teaching um, or study is, is really vital. And then the benefits for staff of increased flexibility and work-life balance yeah, that many people are looking for, um, as well as the opportunities to think about and design new services and that those services should promote satisfaction for our users, from our staff and to increase productivity. So we needed a framework to do this within and uh, luckily my boss Chris Banks came up with such a framework. It's got a lot of P's in it. So it could be four P's, it could be eight P's, it could be even more P's if you want it to be. But we can start with people and places post pandemic. And then thinking about the framework itself that encompassed policies, practicalities, 
personal preferences and performance and place. So have you think about some of those parts of the framework. Policies, obviously you need the policies to back up hybrid working. So do we have the HR policies in place to allow this? Do we have yeah, the contracts people might change to? Do we have expenses and travel and accommodation policies that yeah, work with, a new, with new ways of working? Uh, do we have policies for equipment provision and use of shared space? And obviously very, uh, very importantly, health and safety policies and practices. On the practicalities side, uh, we need to think very much about the technology to enable hybrid working. So at the moment, I imagine lots of places have desktop PCs, but are we moving more towards staff having laptops that they can bring in and out of work as necessary and having docking stations rather than fixed terminal PCs? Do we have the AV and conferencing facilities within our meeting spaces to allow the kinds of things that might happen in the future? I imagine at the moment, people are still using yeah, a meeting individually uh, in many cases rather than getting together in rooms. But in the, in the future, we might have half a dozen people in a meeting room and another half a dozen people on a Teams call at home. So do we have the facilities to allow people to actually do that effectively rather than everybody sitting around their own laptops with a horrible feedback clash or everybody crowding around one person's laptop? What, what technology do we need to, to allow that? Personal storage, pedestals, lockers, uh, technology to, to allow the kind of remote working, whether that's VPNs, virtual desktops, other technology that ICT might be dreaming up over the next few months. Knowledge management is another area that we've had to give considerable thought to, and I don't think we've got right yet, but uh, we, we were using a lot of shared network drives uh, within the library. Uh, those weren't terribly accessible from home. You had to remote desktop in. Um, and we moved very quickly to move a lot of stuff into SharePoint and Teams when the pandemic struck. But we didn't do that in the most organised way. And I would say that there are still a lot of things that are in silos. It would be better to have access across the department. So thinking about those knowledge management aspects as well. And then thinking about things like booking systems to allow you know, space or kit to be loaned. In terms of the preferences, we know that people have lots of different you know, preferences and that those preferences are likely to have an impact on, on their performance. So what incentives do we have for people to come back into the office if uh, you know, that's necessary? What are their motivations? And you know, what, what motivates them to either come in or maybe their motivations to, to work from home and, and, and how does that impact on their performance? You know, their personal preferences, you know, how do those act as an enabler for performance? Um, you know, ideally, we want to improve the performance of our team. We want to improve the service for our users. So how can we ensure that those personal preferences actually play out in that way and, and, and improve our performance? And then places is, is very important as well. So are we looking at a future with shared hot desks and shared spaces? Are those spaces going to be bookable? How do we think about some of the changes that we've made to our spaces over the last few years? A lot of staff were using varied height and adjustable desks. How do we ensure that people have access to those in the future, both on site in bookable forms or, or at home? And then thinking, as I said, about the smaller footprint that we might occupy uh, and uh, using that more flexibly uh, to, to free up space for the college. And obviously, as we mentioned, ensuring that it's technologically, uh, technologically enabled. So that's the main framework, but overarching that, we had three themes of our community, our services, and our well-being, which we really used to kind of ground ourselves and to make sure that those were those were in the forefront of our thoughts at all times. And the outcome of this, I suppose, was a, was a kind of motto of as flexible as possible and as fixed as necessary. We really felt that encapsulated the, the way that we wanted to approach this. So how do we put this framework into action? Well, we spent time reflecting with each of the teams on the new and innovative practices that have gone on over the last year, and also thinking about what practices have become obsolete and we want to leave behind. We surveyed our staff to find out their views, and we've also been upgrading the technology to, to meet the needs of our future workspaces. And then at the moment, we're in the process of planning new work patterns and, and trialing those changes. And I will stress the aspect of trialing changes rather than formalizing them at the moment. So just to pick up on some of these activities. So um, this is the changes in working practice during the pandemic grid exercise that 
uh, initially came from the relationship management conference that a colleague attended. And this was a really fantastic exercise that we carried out with all of the teams within the library. On the left hand side, you've got activities uh, that, well, oh, sorry, on the left hand side, you've got uh, activities that carried out during the pandemic. And then on the right hand side, what we want to do afterwards. Uh, on the top row, we've got activities we started, and on the bottom row, activities we've stopped. And this has lead, led to these four quadrants. So temporary measures that, we've, uh, that we want to end, innovative practices that we want to amplify, obsolete activities that we want to let go, and paused activities that we want to restart. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to pick out a few of them because as I said, this was a really useful um, opportunity to reflect on what's gone on. So some of the temporary measures were really quite practical, like quarantining books. And if I never have to look at a quarantine book procedure again, it will be too late because I've spent far too much of my time thinking about book quarantine processes. Uh, one-way systems and social distancing i'm sure we'd all like to see the end of that but obviously that will have to wait until the government and college says that it's safe to do so so that's a little way off yet it seems but hopefully soon that will be possible uh, lots of innovative practices and it's really nice to see that that quadrant was the, the fullest quadrant that we, that we had um, but things like uh, some practical things like moving to three-week loans for everybody we used to have different loan periods for different user groups um, Having open hold shelves, we, we had an open reservation system at the central library, but all of my medical libraries have now moved to having uh, the holds available on the floor so people can pick those up at any time. We developed an in-house document delivery service for our NHS users when our space is closed and our NHS users could no longer come in and use a walk-in access to our e-resources. Uh, we very quickly developed the, the in-house document delivery service and that's absolutely something we want to continue. And then we developed online tutorials to support all levels of study. And that's something I'm really proud of and something that we want to you know, develop further and build on. And I'm going to say this, but online meetings as well. I'm sure many of us are sick to the back teeth of endless Teams meetings or Zoom meetings, but actually there are benefits to them as well. So managing five campus libraries, I had to do an awful lot of traveling around to meet people. And that's not something I want to give up because I really value the opportunity to get out there and meet my team and to see the spaces and to see what, what's going on. But there are other times when you're pushed for time and the thought of schlepping across to another campus really isn't ideal. And having the opportunity to have those teams meetings, I think in the future will be really valuable. Briefly, the paused activities we want to restart with things like the face to face teaching, obviously getting back. Would be really good when that's safe and appropriate to do so. And at the time when we when we did this exercise, we hadn't restarted our evening and weekend services. So, uh, you yeah, we wanted to, re, uh, to do that. And that has now happened. Uh, obsolete activities as well. Not too many of those, but um, all staff meetings is something I will highlight. We used to have termly all staff briefings from our director and other people who would give presentations that would happen at the central library and then uh, we would you know the heads of team would then have to go out to all the different campuses and regurgitate these presentations as best they could to the to the, to the um, teams at the different libraries and whilst that worked okay and it did have the benefit of people going out and visiting my libraries which i think was valued it also meant that uh, they didn't necessarily get the same quality of experience as this the people at Central Library. And what we've moved to now is bi-weekly all staff briefings by our director, Chris Banks. Uh, and this has been hugely valuable. Uh, the staff have really, really appreciated this. And we have a anonymous Mentimeter questions for those meetings. And that's really, really been good for engagement. People feel able to ask challenging questions. And there have been some very challenging questions over the last year. But they really feel that that opportunity to speak directly to our director and to to ask those challenging questions and to get answers to them has been hugely valuable. So that's something we will not be changing. So as I also mentioned, we carried out a post-COVID working preferences survey. Um, this was really to look at, at what we wanted to do medium to long term, to ask people for their opinion about flexible working and remote working and coming back onto campus. This was carried out in late February and as I say, focused on the medium to long term. We had over 100 responses, which pretty much represents the entire department, which was very, very good response and really did uh, represent a wide variety of views. 
I'll just pick out a few slides from this. Um, some of these are represent the whole, whole department's response. And a couple of them are just my team, so I'll highlight those. But this is this is a whole department where we asked about what the positive aspects of working remotely. Not really a surprise, but many people don't like traveling to work. And if you've got to spend an hour and a half each way on a hot, smelly tube with your nose in somebody's armpit, the thought of not having to pay for the pleasure of that is probably a good thing. So many people didn't like commuting to work and, and that's a positive. The flexibility of hours and the ability to concentrate more easily and also plan their day came out as, as strong uh, positives for people. Thinking about the most challenging aspects, very clear that many people missed working with their colleagues and being around their colleagues. That's very clear for me. I'm a sociable person and I like working with other people in an office environment. And I, I really miss that now that our offices are so empty. Uh, other people highlighted the lack of exercise. You know, lots of people cycle to work. I used to hop off the tube early at Earl's Court and walk to South Kensington. And I really liked that. And many people missed that opportunity as well. In terms of what type of environments people work in, not really a clear answer to this because a lot of people highlighted the, the, you know, the need for a mixture of environments and actually that can be maybe a challenge for, for remote working because if you're working at home and you've got a particular environment you work in at home um, do you have that, that that different type of environment you need when when you when you want it but there was a real range of preferences there including quiet environments that many people maybe in libraries are unsurprised to, to see that, that we've got lots of people who like quiet environments as well so where it got complicated was things like communication. The statistics really divided on whether remote working was positive or negative in terms of communication for within the team, and then also working across library teams and working across the university as a whole. But thankfully, the comments did present a more nuanced picture that allowed us to kind of dive a bit deeper into some of these questions and, and pick out what some of the thoughts that people had. It's worth you know, recognizing that the wide variety of skills and strengths and the services that we deliver mean that there is going to be a lot of preferences. Lots of different individual staff have lots of different preferences. And then the services that we deliver also you know, might mean that we have different preferences evolving out of that. So just looking at the, the communication issue. So working remotely with our team, um, the largest proportion of staff said that the communication was about the same. But we had about 20% who both said it got more difficult and also less difficult. So it's not terribly clear the outcome of that, but certainly you know, a significant minority of staff felt that it had got more difficult working with, with their team. And that's maybe not a surprise if you're used to working uh, you know, nearby to your team and just turning around to kind of ask a question of somebody. And now maybe you've got to you know, ask them via a Teams chat or an email instead. But working across the library or working across the university uh, had a great proportion of staff saying that it was about the same. And actually a larger proportion said it was less difficult with a smaller proportion saying it was more difficult. And I think that maybe speaks to the opportunities that some of these technologies allow for, yeah, uh, for greater communication. And the fact that we're probably having more meetings than ever. I'm sure that's a reality for many of us. But that does have the benefit of at least allowing better communication. So one of the things that I found quite concerning, and this is a slide which is looking just at, at my team, the, the medical library team, um, was perhaps the, the, the difference between um, what people wanted in terms of their working from home and what they felt was necessary. So the orange bars here are, are people's preferences and the blue bars are what they felt was necessary. Now it's clear that actually there's a lot of people who've put, you know, tick the other box or the it depends box. Uh, and that came out in the comments. And, and I think there's a recognition that for many of them uh, in, in the small teams that staff my, my medical libraries, um, it really would depend on the other staff and their working patterns. But there were some concerns like the fact that only one person said that they thought they'd need to be in five days a week, which given that we operate a frontline service was a little concerning to me. There was also a lot of people who said that they only wanted to be in one to two days a week. And that mismatch between perhaps what, what I thought was going to be necessary and what staff preferred was, was a bit of a concern for me. But as I say, there was a recognition often that people would need to vary throughout the year. So somebody said that their role varies and changes depending on the time of year. Some parts of the year, they'd only need to be in two to three days a week. However, when they were in the middle of the teaching, they'd have to be in more. Some other comments that came out 
uh, staff, one, one of my team who works in the, our NHS service said they were scared about the damage that working remotely might cause to their relationships with the NHS, but that these fears have proved unfounded and their relationships have uh, been good and have developed. Somebody said, it's always easier to turn to somebody in the office and ask a question or for, uh, for help uh, on an issue than working remotely, which involves a lot of back and forth emails. And that speaks to what we were talking about when it came to communication within the team. But equally, somebody else said that they found that communication within the team and with others had really opened up with remote working. They said they're, they're more, uh, they're, they're now talking more often and with more staff across the library who all appear to be more relaxed in their new working environment. They also, uh, somebody else said that they feel more part of the Imperial Libraries as a whole and have had the opportunity to form new relationships and make new contacts. And I suspect this is probably uh, somebody from my team because for the medical campus libraries, they're working in small teams, in small libraries. There was a sense that whilst we tried to do a lot to make them part of the, the broader library team, they often felt more part of that individual library team or perhaps the medicine team, but sometimes not the whole library team. So this is really positive to see those kind of comments. So moving forward with this, as I say, our, our motto has been as flexible as possible and as fixed as necessary. We've said that we need to keep an open dialogue with staff. We need to be talking to them about what our plans are and listening to them in terms of what their preferences are. But in doing so, we need to prioritize the service and our users' needs. We need to talk to our users. And actually, I think this is something that so far has probably been a little bit missing from our, from our response. Um, we want to carry out survey work, but we haven't really felt the opportunity to do that given that there are so many surveys going around from within the college to the students asking for their opinions on what's going on at the moment uh, but we will do that in the future we want to facilitate choice wherever possible and that's the as flexible as possible part of our motto motto but recognize that there are going to be limitations and be honest with staff and that comes down to being as fixed as necessary um, this is Quite a complicated slide that I've borrowed from my boss, who who uh, really kind of dive deep into what this might, yeah, what some of this framework might look like in reality. So um, she'd called this uh, balancing multi dimensions to achieve optimal outcomes of service, team, and community. And yeah, across the middle there, you've got the the range of you know uh, hybrid working, and also yeah, on the left hand side full-time at home and on the right-hand side, full-time on campus with, with hybrid working in, in between. Uh, we've got very clear evidence now coming out that there are individual preferences that span that, that broad range from full-time at home to full-time on campus. And then we've got things like team cohesion, which I think you could probably make quite a clear argument for being stronger when everybody's on campus, but that may have drawbacks as well. And then you've got maybe another argument around service quality. And I think you could probably make the argument that having staff full-time on campus could potentially improve service quality, but I think that's maybe less of a clear distinction. And, and there may be areas where, where actually that doesn't necessarily, that isn't necessarily the case. So um, I think that's an interesting one there. Again, spanning the range of, of hybrid working, we need to be thinking about our workspaces and our technology and, and what we do to, to make sure that we've got the facilities uh, and the technology to enable hybrid working. Um, and another aspect, as, as, as we talked about in that, that framework, is the health and safety uh, policies and practices, you know, the guidance we need to have in place for staff returning to the office, the risk assessments that I'm sure we've all carried out, uh, and the, yeah, and the, the um, equipment and the PPE that we've made available. Where we settle on this uh, as a college is a policy called transition and learn. This is now college's policy and it's going to be a time to test hybrid ways of working and determine the le level of flexibility that's possible and desirable for the team. So again, how, how does transition and learn work in practice? Uh, this is going to be a six month period of practical implementation of hybrid working. Um, so I think it's fair to say that 
we, yeah, everybody, and I suspect this is a case for, for a lot of organizations, is already doing a huge amount of hybrid working. Assuming that a lot of library services have restarted in person, you're going to have staff in the office, but you're also going to have lots of people working from home. And that's the case for us very much at the moment as well. But we've said that from the point where um, social distancing rules can be eased and we can really get more staff into the office where needed, um, we will start at that six month period uh, of formally assessing different ways of working. During that period, we're not going to make any final decisions about you know, the, the, the working patterns of individual staff. It will be trialing it out. But it, you know, we also need to recognize that, that the availability of working from home and the flexibility that will be possible will be highly role dependent. And that can sometimes be quite difficult to, to talk to people about. At a college level, the college is looking at three types of employment contract. So a largely on campus based contract, a hybrid contract and a fully remote contract. And within my team, at least, and probably within the library as a whole, whilst we're anticipating significant levels of hybrid working, we think we're unlikely to move lots of people onto the hybrid contracts, just because we need to maintain that flexibility to uh, allow people to come in and cover where we've got sickness, where we've got leave. We don't really want to get ourselves into a situation where we have working patterns locked into contracts, which mean that we don't have that flexibility of getting people in uh, to, to those uh, to those uh, to, to cover those emergencies or requirements like leave. So, as I said, this is going to be quite role dependent. There are going to be roles that are largely based on site, with the occasional opportunity for work from home. And I, and I hope that we will be able to offer more flexibility for these types of roles, but it will probably be quite limited. So, library assistants, frontline supervisors, our library attendants, and people like our facilities coordinator. They will probably be on site most of the time, but there may be opportunities for them to maybe work um, from home if there's a, a particular need, they've got the plumber coming or the need to wait in for a delivery, we could arrange a work from home day, or even potentially for some of those staff, if they've got project work or regular work that they need to get their head down, they might have a day where they're working from home on a regular basis, which I think would be quite new for us. Certainly before COVID, we weren't doing that kind of stuff. Then there's going to be quite a lot of hybrid roles. So thinking about things like our subject librarians, um, our NHS support librarians, most managers, I would say, would fall into this category. The library systems team, many of whom are, who are keen to work from home, but actually we've, we've said that we do want them on site as well to do some of the troubleshooting that's necessary for the systems team. And then content is this discovery who encapsulate our acquisitions, subscriptions and document delivery team uh, all have elements which they need to, to come onto campus for. Roles that can be uh, yeah, worked largely off site with occasional days in the office are, are yeah, roles within our scholarly communications team. So that's the open access team, research data management team, uh, and, and uh, copyright manager. Uh, most of their roles can really be done off site with only occasionally need to come on site for outreach and advocacy act, uh, activities. And then there are probably a handful of managers who might fit into this category as well, but mostly we think the managers will be working hybrid type work patterns. So that's where we are now and where we're heading for the next six months. We're running into this transition and learn period. So just thought quickly, I'd reflect on where we are and, and where we're going. And just to highlight, as I said, that engagement and open discussion is key. Um, those all staff briefings I mentioned have been such a fantastic development for us. So we will be using those uh, as we go forward, um, but also making sure that I continue the discussions with my team and keep those channels of communication open. Taking that time to reflect on the past 16 months um, I think is, is really important. Yeah, there's so much opportunities for learning from what we've done, uh, what's worked well and what we need to improve on. So do take that time to reflect with your teams. Never forget the library users. They're, they're whilst, they are why, why we are here and our services are there to support them. So we need to make sure that those are at the forefront of our mind. And remember that flexibility works both ways. So I'm really happy if we can allow more flexibility for members of our team. But as I said, I, I don't want to get into a situation where people are, are saying, 
Tuesday's my work from home day. I can't come in and cover the leave on Tuesday because that's my work from home day. That's not a situation that certainly in the small teams that I manage at the, at the campus libraries, um, I can end up in. Do be prepared for a few tough conversations. Um, I've had maybe a, you know, just a couple of these so far, but some of them have been quite tough. I've had one library assistant who really didn't want to come back on site to work uh, as much as we felt was necessary, and they didn't want to work within the time period that was set out in the transition and learn process. And actually the end result was that they decided they were gonna cut the number of days they worked for us. Uh, that was done by mutual consent, um, but it's a shame that they, they felt they weren't able to kind of work within that framework. But for them, uh, the opportunities um, of spending more time at home were the, you know, the paramount uh, uh, factor in their decision. Uh, I would say avoid making those firm commitments too early. We are using the transition and learn period to go through at least the first term and the summer where we'll have lots of staff off on leave and then hopefully all our students back on campus and back in the library again. So we really need to stress test our new ways of working and make sure that we've got the flexibility, not just to cover the day-to-day -day operations, but from my point of view, where we've got small teams working at campuses, I need to know that we can cover you know, inter-campus you know, with like we used to previously, making sure that we've got people who can cover leave and cover sickness. But the end result of all of this should be happier and healthier staff and hopefully a much better service for our users. Any questions uh, on any of that? Oh, Simon, so many questions. That would be <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. And I would like to work at Imperial, please. So if you've got any openings, do give us a shout. <laughs> that was really, really interesting. It was so comprehensive. It was so generous in terms of the insights as to how Imperial are working. So many, many thanks for that. Without further ado, I'm going to avoid all the questions that I've got and focus on the ones that other people have got. So I'm going to avoid Chair's prerogative to barge you with all, all the questions that I've got. But the, this, the expenses and the equipment, the balancing of equipment that people are needing at home, the, um, those sorts of things, the, the possible increase of expense by virtue of working from home, all that type of thing. Do you have any issue? I mean, there's, there's costs at, at so many different stages, whether it's repurposing staff space for library users, whether it's making sure that there's equipment moving from desktop to laptop, that's going to be, pay dividends in the end, but it's there's an expense to begin with, all of those different sorts of things. If, have you got I, any comments about the expense of moving to a different way of working? Uh, well, right. yes. <laughs> it's expensive would be my, my um, would, be, would be my observation. But we've also um, made savings in other areas. And I think we've, we've repurposed our budget and used it flexibly. So um, you know, we, for instance, weren't paying for all of the normal things that we were doing, like sending people to conferences and travel and accommodation that go with that. And, you know, I think um, I, I, yeah, I recognise that actually we're lucky at Imperial that we're, we're quite a well-resourced library. And I know having worked at other institutions, that's not the case everywhere. So we have been able to use things like our staff development and, and travel and accommodation budget to facilitate other activities, whether that's things like uh, laptops for staff um, who are working remotely and and again we, we have a budget for, for ICT replacement and we've used that very much for focusing on, on purchasing laptops which is not easy at the moment there's long delays in doing that but we've been we've been using that um, you know we've, we've used our operational budget that we have for you know, improving our facilities each year um, to do things like kit out our, our staff um, meeting rooms with the, the type of technology I was talking about. So our, our meeting rooms, certainly at the Central Library, now have um, screens with sound bars and cameras in them so that we can uh, get people, when it's possible, around a table in the meeting room, but also working remotely. But it is expensive. And yeah, we've maybe looked at things like... Um, yeah, whether we need to do th things that we would normally do, like replacing all our chairs, well, not all of our chairs, but we have an annual cycle of replacing the chairs in the libraries. We're not doing that this year because actually the libraries have much less use. So we're, we're making savings where we can to, to, to facilitate the changes that we need to make. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, 
just going down, I'm not going to be asking all the questions, just I'm just conscious of, of time, but um, in terms of your quadrant diagram, who is involved in compiling that and who is involved in sort of giving the impetus in terms of what is what should be taken forward and everything else? Mm -hmm. How did you get enough feedback but not be overwhelmed with that? That's, that's come from Ruth. So um, we we did that with each of the teams in the library. So um, I've actually done two of those. So I've done that once with, with my team, uh, the medicine team, and then also as part of the leadership team. Uh, and each team carried out their own exercise. Um, I'll give a big, big shout out to Miro, which is the Miro boards, which is what I use for that. Uh, they're fantastic. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, Padlet is dead to me because Miro is where it's at. But it was a really good way of um, getting everybody interacting. Um, and I had all of my team working within their kind of campus library groups, swapping around the quadrants uh, uh, throughout the kind of process and, and adding their comments to it on those post, those kind of virtual post-it notes. And that worked really, really well. And, and then we fed those back via the all-staff briefings that I mentioned as well. Um, so each team took a turn feeding those back into the wider department and, and talking about what we felt we wanted to continue and what we felt we wanted to drop. And there was a lot of, a lot of shared you know, uh, outcomes from those, but uh, it was really good to see what other teams came up with as well. Yeah, I'm going to, with regret, pause it there. There's lots of other questions and comments, and I'm sure as you look through the chat, you'll be able to see the sorts of things that are coming up. But because I want to make sure that there's a break before the, the breakout rooms, I'm going to pause with the questions, regrettably, because it could suck your brain for the rest of the morning, mm -hmm. and it would be a hugely valuable exercise. So thank you very much indeed, Simon. That was, that was great. Just was great. Thank Much you. Appreciated. I'm going to give us a chance for a 10 minute break now. 